fact that the mind is like a committee is often a problem. So many different ideas, so many different values pulling us in so many different directions. But one of the things we're learning to do as we meditate is take this committee mind and actually use it to our advantage. In other words, while you're with the breath, you're going to need a part of the mind that keeps reminding you that you have to stay here. That's the mindfulness part of the meditation. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha said there are five factors to the first level of right concentration. Because the mind is doing several things at once, even though it's focused on one object. On the one hand, it's experiencing the object, and then it's reminding itself to stay there, and it's evaluating it. So you've got three members of the committee right there, keeping check on one another. So that if one of them starts wandering off or gets lazy or stops working, the others can wake it up. So you're reminding yourself to stay with the breath, and you're noticing how it feels, and then you're evaluating to see, does this feel as good as it could? And then you use your imagination, you use your ingenuity to ask yourself, well, are there other ways you could be breathing that would be easier to settle down with? And then you check to see how, the, how it's working. This is an important principle the Buddha uses throughout his teachings, is look at what you're doing and look at the results, and expect that there are going to be mistakes, but be willing to learn from them. I was noticing the other day a book called Einstein's Mistakes, which points out how Einstein learned from his mistakes. Sounds like an interesting book. Saying this is part of the this is the clue to the fact that he was able to get things right. He'd try something out, come up with an idea, and then he'd test it. Then if he noticed that something wasn't right, he'd go back and wouldn't let himself get discouraged. He'd just keep coming back, coming back, saying there must be a solution to this. I had a question about optimism in the practice this afternoon, and this is the main source of optimism, that there have been people in the past, starting with the Buddha, who, with basically the same strengths and weaknesses that we have, were able to put an end to suffering. So that's the conviction that can be done. The people who have done it, not only amazing people like the Buddha, but more ordinary people. But the fact they were able to do it depended on their conviction that there's got to be a way out of here. If you're lost in the woods and you don't think there's a way out, you're not going to find the way out. You just give up. But it's that determination and that conviction, there's got to be a way out, it can be done. Then your willingness to Use trial and error, and then try to be as honest with yourself about the results you're getting. That's how it's done. So it's important that you not get discouraged by mistakes or the ups and downs of the meditation. Those are going to happen. This is where it's useful to have several committee members, so maybe the part of the mind that's down. And all you can think about is how it's not going the way you want it to. Well, try to find a member of the committee that can rouse you. Say, hey, someone else has done this. Other people have done this. You look into the Taragata and the Tarigata, and you find people are really in bad shape. But they were able to turn themselves around. A lot of it had to do with the conviction that there is a way out. It can be done. And their willingness to learn from their mistakes, their ability to use those different members of the committee. When things go well, you need several members of the committee as well. 
because there's a part of the committee that gets lazy and careless when things are going well and starts letting things slide. That's when you need the member of the committee that's more of a taskmaster. You think things are going well, but you can't expect that they're just going to go well on their own. You still have to protect them. You still have to watch after, after them. So you don't get careless. Even when insights arise, you need a governing member of the committee to watch out. Say, okay, don't get carried away by the insight. Watch what happens next if you take that insight and accept it. How does the mind respond? And exactly how far is that insight true? And John Lee recommends turning the insight around, saying, well, to accept what extent is the opposite of this insight true? Say so you see that a certain way of breathing feels really good. Does it always feel really good? One common mistake in the meditation is say, oh, I finally found the way to breathe, or the place to focus. And all I do have, have to do from now on is just stay with this one way of breathing and this one spot of focus. And after a while it doesn't work. And then you get disgusted with it and you throw it away. But that doesn't help. What helps is remember, it gets good for certain situations and not good for others. So you file it away. You don't throw it away. You file it away. So that whenever that kind of bodily state comes up or that mental state comes up, you've got something on file. You can pull it out, put it to use, and after some trial and error you begin to realize what works and what doesn't work, and when things work and when things don't work. So it's a complex skill we're learning here. The mind is the most complex thing there is. As the Buddha said, it's more variegated than the animal kingdom. You think of all the different kinds of animals there have been and will be and are in the world. And yet the mind is more variegated than that, because after all, it was the mind that invented those animals to begin with. The mind state that said, I'd like to be a snake. I'd like to not have to bother with it. arms and legs and just slither around. Another mind state that wanted to fly, and all the different ways of flying that it tried. The mind is capable of all kinds of things. It certainly stands to reason that when you're training it, it's going to have all kinds of tricks. Another passage in the canon, an elephant trainer is talking about how difficult it is to understand human beings. He says, bring me an elephant, within a week I'll know all that elephant's tricks. The elephant, he said, is plain enough, but the human mind, the human being, that's a puzzle. But here we are working with this puzzle, and it's very complex. So it stands to reason that there are going to be ups and downs and good times and bad times. And you find a technique that works for one aspect of the mind, but it's not going to work for others. Well, it doesn't mean it's useless, it means it's, it's got its place. But we're not totally at sea with a huge number of variables. As a John Fuhrer noted, they take those seven steps in a John Lee's breath meditation instructions in Method 2, and you check them. How are you doing with regard to those seven steps? He said any problem that was presented to him when he was teaching could be solved by applying those different steps. So try to keep those in mind. Are you working with the, the breath in different parts of the body? Are you focusing on one spot? How do you do both at the same time? Well, that's part of the skill. Are you aware of the length and shortness of the breath, the different qualities of the in-breath? Are you connecting all the different breath channels in the body so that the body is breathing together? All the different parts of the body are breathing in a cooperative way and not at cross-purposes. Which spot in the body do you find works best for you? Because the different spots, again, will work well for different mental states. 
and different physical conditions in the body. So try to work with those principles. and train at least one member of the committee to remember them. And when you need patience, bring up your patient member. And when you need to be persistent, bring up your persistent member. In other words, learn how to train the different members of the committee. It's like that lesson in the Iliad. The whole point of the the poem is to show that the Greeks had lots of different types of soldiers, and each of the soldiers had his uses. Ulysses was good for some things, Achilles was good for others. And what brought about success was that they were learning how to use one another's strengths. In other words, there's no one ideal meditator. And there's no one mind state that's going to save everything. You will use different qualities. There's all those lists that the Buddha has. Five this, seven that, eight this. We're putting these things together. We're training different members of the committee so they're all on the same page, helping one another. And you emphasize whichever member of the committee is needed when you're Getting a little careless, okay, bring in the more meticulous side. When you're getting discouraged, bring in the more equanimous, persistent, convinced this is going to work side. And turn them all into strengths. So by working together, everybody gets to the goal.